From Microbe TV, this is Beyond the Noise, episode number 14, recorded on August 29th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello, Paul. Good to have you again. This is a video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. And today I'd like to talk about your column called Back to School, the quest to eliminate vaccine mandates. And you start the column by noting that 35% of parents now oppose school mandates. What's the reason for that? I think it's a backlash to what's happened over the last few years. I think there was a significant percentage of the population that did not like to be told what to do. They didn't like to be told that they had to mask. They didn't like to be told that they had to be vaccinated or else they couldn't come to work. Um, And I think we basically leaned into this libertarian left hook. And this is the backlash to that. Last year, there were 835 lawsuits um, at the state and local level against mandates of any sort. And I think this has spilled over to now childhood vaccines. And it worries me a lot because I think the the one that that, uh, is most likely to come back first, the, the most contagious of the vaccine preventable diseases is measles. So why would measles be the first one to come back? Right. So so it's because it's the most contagious. So so, for example, there's something called the R naught, which is the contagiousness index. So, for example, if I had measles and then I went about my normal day and everybody I came in contact with was susceptible to that infection, I would infect 18 people. To put that in perspective, um, SARS-CoV-2, COVID, the cause of COVID, has a contagiousness index of about three. So it's far, far more contagious. The other thing is it's spread by very, very small droplets, so-called aerosol droplets. And and so, for example, if someone comes into our hospital um, with suspected measles and they're taken back to a treatment room and we investigate and find that they did have measles, after they leave that room, no one can go in that room for another two hours waiting for these small particles which hang like ghosts in the air to settle. I think the most dramatic example of the contagiousness of measles occurred in Indiana in 2005. There was a 17-year-old girl who was unvaccinated, who was part of a church mission, went to Bucharest, Romania, where she visited a number of sites, including an orphanage, where she proceeded to be exposed to measles. She then gets on a plane, comes back to Indiana, where the next day she attends a church picnic with 500 people there, 500 people there. Of the 500 people that were there, 50 were susceptible to measles, 50 mixed into this crowd of 500. 16 got measles. One third of those people got measles, which tells you she didn't have to have direct face-to-face contact with, with them. She, they only had to be in her airspace within two hours of her being there. I mean, we've had an increase in measles. We had 1,200 cases of measles in, uh, in 2019. Then it sort of came down associated with the pandemic because we were doing better at masking and social distancing and isolating and quarantining. And now it's starting to come back up again. So you saw the, the first five months of this year, 2023, we've had a five-fold increase as compared to the first five months of last year. Get to thousands of cases of measles and we'll once again see, see children die from measles in this country. How many kids would have to not be vaccinated to, to have an outbreak? Right. So this is the in order to have so-called herd immunity, where you have a significant decrease in the spread of the virus because a significant percentage of the population has been vaccinated, you really need to be in sort of the low 90 percent range, sort of 93, 94 percent. Once you drop below that, then you'll see measles come roaring back. And I, I just don't think we appreciate this virus. I, measles makes you sick. Before there was a measles vaccine in 1963, every year there would be three to four million cases of measles in this country. There would be about 48,000 hospitalizations and 500 deaths. I remember when uh, Jenny McCarthy was on Oprah years ago when she sort of launched her career as an anti-vaccine activist. Um, she believed that the measles, mumps, or vaccine had caused her son's autism, which wasn't true. The vaccine doesn't do that. But nonetheless, she said something on that show I'll never forget. She said, and I quote, I'll take the freaking measles every time. 
So what that means is she wasn't scared of measles. It, it, people, and that's not only that we've largely eliminated measles, we've eliminated the memory of measles. I, I can, when I come into, to the, when I'm in the hospital and there's somebody in the emergency department who has fever and a rash and they want to know whether it's measles, sometimes they ask old people like me to come down because we've seen a lot of measles. And I can tell in 30 seconds whether somebody has measles because they're sick. I mean, often the, aside from cough, congestion, uh, runny nose, and sort of a, a rash that begins at the hairline and then spreads down. They're photophobic. They're invariably photophobic, meaning they are intolerant to light. So the lights are down because they have mild encephalopathy. I mean, that is a characteristic of that, that infection. You can also get severe encephalitis, but almost all the time they have mild encephalopathy. Um, they're sick. Not good to have anything inside your brain of that sort, is it? Right, and I'm not sure whether it's that the virus is directly replicating in, in neural, neuronal cells or there is yeah. just a kind of, sort of a general uh, phenomenon of the immune response. But um, if you see someone with measles, you're struck by how sick they are. I remember when I, I was uh, I trained in Baltimore, and, and uh, I remember there was an outbreak in North Baltimore, and our hospital was flooded with measles, and um, it, the hospital beds were flooded with measles. We don't remember that time, but um, I really fear we um, don't appreciate what vaccines have done, and I think vaccines are largely a victim of their own success. Does measles kill? Yes. So before there was there was a measles vaccine every year in this country that you'd have about 500 children die from measles. Yes, measles can kill, and it kills because it causes pneumonia or, or severe dehydration or encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. I, I don't understand this opposition of uh, school vaccine mandates. When I grew up, I got all my vaccines, right? There was no question about it. And even today, there are many countries that get their vaccines. So why? This is not a question you can answer, but I don't understand what's going on in the U.S. that makes us different. I think in this country, we've sort of moved from um, caring about our neighbor to um, just focusing on ourselves. You know, there's as a polio mm. expert, you will appreciate this. There's a movie called, and you've probably seen it, called The Polio Crusade. It was done by Sarah Colt Productions out of, uh, out of Harvard. But what she has in that movie is she has film from people in the 1950s talking about being infected with polio. And when you, when you hear their voices, you want to cry because there's such a societal feeling. They say, oh, you think my polio was bad. You should have seen what happened to Joe over here. And there's a real sense of community. And maybe it's because we were just coming off the shared national tragedy of World War II, or maybe it's because we saw polio as a shared national tragedy, which it was. But COVID is no different. I mean, COVID was a shared, nat shared national tragedy, but if anything, it seemed to tear us apart. Public health is all about caring for others, isn't it? Yes, that's exactly what it's about. You have to care about your neighbor. When people say, look, what do you care, um, you know, uh, whether whether I'm vaccinated, you know, you've been vaccinated, but vaccines aren't 100% effective. And if a critical percentage of the population isn't vaccinated, these, these diseases will come back. And some people, even though they're vaccinated, may get it and be severely affected. Yeah, we see many, many measles deaths globally in other countries who, for one reason or another, can't vaccinate. And they would very much like to be able to, but it's not available to them. That's right. Uh, and I think uh, that's our responsibility, really, as a, as a technologically advanced wealthy country, is to do everything we can to make sure that those countries get the vaccines they need and to pay for them if they can't. So after measles, I, I presume if a parent doesn't want mandatory vaccination. They won't get any vaccine. So in, besides measles, what other uh, infections would be a problem? Well, so, so mumps still sort of roils below the surface. So I think that that would cut back. Rubella or German measles, we eliminated from this country by 2005. But again, lower immunization rates and you'll see that come back. And then there's diseases like pneumococcus, you know, which kind of also uh, uh, certainly occur. Chickenpox certainly occurs. I mean, when you vaccinate at two, four and six months of age, you're really trying to prevent diseases that occur in that six to 24 month old age group like pneumococcus, rotavirus, whooping cough um, and others. And influenza type B. And, you know, we've done a very good job at getting those numbers down. But remember, schools are often the site where these these uh, these outbreaks occur. Measles is primarily a disease of the five to nine year old. And when you see outbreaks, often they will start in schools and then spread out. So that's why school ma mandates are so important, not only for those school children, but for the people with whom they come in contact. So the, the uh, mandates, vaccine mandates for schools, that's done on a state by state level. Is that correct? That's right. There's there's no federal vaccine mandates. It's done state by state. And so uh, are there states that don't have school vaccine mandates already? 
Well, well there, or they would have school vaccine mandates, but they wouldn't be for all vaccines. Th- those decisions are made really at the local level. I think from a parent standpoint, the only thing that should matter is um, did the FDA license this product and did the CDC recommend it? That's that's all you should need to know, because often those decisions that are made at state or local levels have much more to do with what can be afforded, especially in a group that, that can't pay for vaccines uh, as than anything else. So in terms of whether a vaccine is safe and effective, it, you should get it if it's recommended period. And really, mandates are, in, in a sense, irrelevant. I mean, in a better world, you wouldn't need mandates. In a better world, people would look at the information and say, of course, I'll, I'll get vaccinated. I mean, my children are both fully vaccinated. I have two children, both fully vaccinated. I consider myself relatively well-educated about vaccines. And I think if other everybody else was well-educated about vaccines, we wouldn't need mandates. But sadly, we do. So that's actually a good point. Do we actually know if we don't have a mandate that many people will choose not to vaccinate their kids? Yes, I know. I think that that's happened. I mean, we saw also, for example, in the 1970s, you saw um, there were outbreaks in Alaska or Los Angeles. And there was another one in sort of Texarkana where the um, there was a critical drop. And the only way really to get people to see these children vaccinated would say you cannot come back to school until you vaccinate. And a lot of people were reluctant, but that was the choice. Go to public school or don't go to public school. And then, you know, the vaccine, the vaccine mandates work. Uh, that, that, that's absolutely sadly true. They do. I remember when when I was uh, rounding during in 2020 when uh, COVID was at its peak in this country. Um, I remember there was one family, a child was was old enough to have been vaccinated and the vaccine was um, life or authorized by that time. He was over 12. But so he was in severe pneumonia. He was in the hospital. He, his mother wasn't vaccinated. His siblings weren't vaccinated, but the father was vaccinated, which struck me and I, I asked the father why were you vaccinated and he said because if uh, if I didn't get vaccinated I couldn't go to work so I do think people can be compelled I, the most striking story to me actually was um, I wrote a book called bad faith and, and the, the hero of this book to me was a, a woman who was a Christian scientist who sadly um, had a 15 month old son who uh, died of haemophilus influenza type B meningitis. And instead of, this was before the vaccine, but it wasn't before antibiotics. So she chose prayer instead of antibiotics and slowly watched her child die. And then she became really interested in trying to understand what she'd done. I mean, she was horrified by what she was done and horrified in many ways, even more so, that she could do it legally. And so she became a vigorous activist really against Christian sciences uh, being allowed to basically put their children in harm's way. But in the, the interviews that I have with her, what struck me the most is she vaccinated her dog. And I asked her why. And she said, because it was the law. So, Paul, do you think we are headed for a situation where, where depending on who, what politician is in charge, we will have uh, relaxed vaccine mandates? Yes, I think that and may not have to have depend on who, who is sort of uh, in charge at the federal level, but I think it will yeah. make a big difference at the local level. I mean, you know, sort of these people like Greg Abbott in Texas, and you can take your pick, but I think they would be very uh, amenable to not having uh, school vaccine mandates because it fits in with their libertarian uh, government off my back philosophy. And do I think measles will come back? I am positive measles is going to come back. And it really, really upsets me because this is all preventable. And I feel like we're falling off a cliff in slow motion. Do you think that a big measles outbreak in the U.S. will get people to realize what they should have done? Yes, I think sadly that's the only thing that's going to get us to realize it is when you see once again children suffering or being hospitalized or dying from this this virus. And I think as, as is always true, it's the most vulnerable among us who suffer our ignorance. Well, children depend on their parents uh, taking care of them. They can't make their own decisions, right? That's right. Although I, I have seen many young children who are smart about vaccines and it's really refreshing to hear them say that. I agree. All right, we will put a link to this column uh, just below the video over on YouTube so you can find it and read it. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you.